So Pat uh, is a uh, research associate at the University of Sydney and a former, former senior research fellow at University of New South Wales where she did her PhD. The topic of which was a comparative study of the World Trade Organization and regional trade agreements. Since then she's published literally dozens of articles, books and monographs on the social impacts of globalization and trade agreements. I'll just mention one picked more or less at random uh, that the, the jumped out at me in, term, in, in terms of Pat's many publications, that Stopping the Juggernaut, the Public Interest versus the Multilateral and Agreement on Investment, an edited collection that she wrote with James Goodman, but there's been many, many more. Um, Pat has a long record working for unions and community organisations in this space. She has been, um, as long as I've known at least, uh, the coordinator of the Australian Fair Trade Investment Network, or AFTNET, <laughs> which is a network of 60 community organisations and many individuals which advocates for fair trade policies based on human rights, labour rights and environmental sustainability. Uh, Pat is going to pick up where Liz left off and talk about uh, where things are moving in trade now. Uh, she's going to uh, tra people uh, trade and development people generally love acronyms, so we have a new acronym acronym to introduce you to now, which is the uh, the RCEP, and Pat's going to explain what that is. So she'll be talking about the movement and the connections between the TPP and the RCEP, amongst other things. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Pat. Thanks very much for that introduction and um, thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, it might help if I just talk about who's, who knows what the 12 countries are that are in the TPP, that were in the TPP? A couple of people, not many. I'll just run quickly through them and then explain how, how that relates to this new agreement, the regional. A comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP. So in the Americas, the ones in the TPP were the US, Canada, Chile, Peru and Mexico and then um, to our north there was Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore and Vietnam and then Australia, Japan and New Zealand. So the, the US really dominated this agreement followed by Japan. Now, the RCEP is different because it's Asia-centred. It doesn't have that American or any countries from the Americas, including the US. What it does have is the 10 ASEAN countries. And uh, as well as Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore and Vietnam, that includes Laos, Myanmar, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand and Cambodia. Now, you can see from that list that there, a lot of those are least developed countries or very low income countries. So that's a, a much different profile from um, the TPP where most of the countries were not uh, developing countries. And the RCEP also includes the big Asian economies like China, India, Korea, Australia, Japan and New Zealand. Or, uh, so the richer ones but also the really big ones. China, India, Japan. So um, it's 16 countries altogether and it includes half of the world's population. Um, half are low income or least developed countries and seven of them you would have noticed were also in the TPP like Australia, New Zealand uh, and Japan, the biggest ones, but a few of the ASEAN countries as well. Um, there have been 17 rounds of secret negotiations since 2012 and I should mention here that all trade negotiations are conducted in secret and we don't see the result of them until the deal is done and that's one of the things we've been campaigning about to have more transparency and I'll mention that more at the end. Um, with the RCEP, business groups have had the opportunity to present their views at every round but only because of agitation from community groups have we had the opportunity recently to present views to negotiators um, at four rounds. So we don't get to see the negotiating documents, and, um, but we have had access to some leaked documents like we did with the TPP. So we do know some of the things that they're actually talking about. 
and they, the aim is to finish it by the end of 2017. So there is still some time through um, community pressure to have some influence. But um, as I said, we won't see the full text until after it's signed and it can't be changed. And our parliament will only vote on the implementing legislation, not the whole agreement. Um, so, um, as Liz said, our major concern about the, TPP, uh, about the RCEP is that there are appearing in it large slabs of, what, of the bad things which were in the TPP. Um, and I won't go through all of those again. The major ones are to do with medicines, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, and um, investor rights to sue governments. But um, there's also um, issues like expanded uh, uh, numbers of temporary workers, temporary migrant workers who are very vulnerable to exploitation, as we've seen through a lot of uh, media and other reports lately, and also restricted government regulation of uh, services. And Michael's going to talk more about that. But those things are also in the RCEP. So, if we look at the power relationships in the RCEP, um, there's, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the media that it's really led by China. Now, China is the biggest player, but it was in fact initiated by the ASEAN group of the 10 ASEAN countries. Um, so, they form a block. China is obviously the biggest economy, but India and Japan are also major players. So, it's more like a multipolar. Um, negotiation, whereas the TPP was really very much dominated by the US and to some extent Japan. Um, so what the lit documents show is that Japan and South Korea are really pushing some of the TPP agenda, particularly on stronger medicine monopolies. Uh, and um, which are, um, delay uh, cheaper medicines from becoming available and very harmful to low-income countries. The intellectual property chapter, which has been leaked, also contains provisions for patenting seeds and plants and stronger monopoly, uh, monopolies on copyright. Um, and um, Japan, South Korea, and to some extent Australia are also supporting a version of investor rights to sue government, which is the same text as the TPP. And there's a services chapter which deregulates services um, and um, contains proposals for increased numbers of temporary workers. Now just to talk a little bit more about what the increased medicine monopolies means, particularly for poorer countries, um, there's a number of ways in which it basically um, extends the 20-year patents that, that um, pharmaceutical companies already have on medicines. They already have 20 years monopoly, but there's uh, a whole series of ways, patent extension, evergreening of patents, data protection, and in particular, reduction of flexibilities for the least developed countries, which they do have through WTO rules. The RCP is seeking to reduce these. That means that they have less ability to bypass patents and produce cheaper medicines if they really need them. Um, so um, you can see how damaging that is. It would also be damaging for Australia because it would lock in bad patent rules um, in Australia. On foreign investors suing governments, um, Liz has um, outlined this, but I just want to make the policy, and she's made the point that even the Howard Coalition government did not agree to this in the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement, but our current government is agreeing to it in agreements like the TPP. Um, it's a very unfair legal framework. Um, what it allows companies to do is bypass national courts and go to international tribunals which are not made up of independent judges, but of um, people who are practicing advocates. And so they can represent a corporation one month and then sit on a tribunal the next month. And there's no precedence or appeals. And the claims safeguards that were supposed to be in the TPP haven't, those same safeguards haven't prevented cases from being 
brought. Um, Liz mentioned the Philip Morris case. Philip Morris couldn't sue under the US-Australia Free Trade Agreement, so it shifted some assets to Hong Kong, said, hey, presto, we're a Hong Kong company, used an obscure Hong Kong investment agreement to sue the Australian government. It didn't win uh, in the end, but it took the tribunal five years and um, nearly $50 million in legal costs for the Australian government to decide that um, Philip Morris wasn't a Hong Kong company. So even if governments win this uh, on a technicality like jurisdiction, they have to spend an awful lot of time, energy and money defending the cases. And there's numerous other cases, um, examples of pharmaceutical companies suing over patent decisions, um, environmental mining companies suing over environmental regulation, um, there's a case where the French Veolia company um, is suing the Egyptian government over a dispute on a local government contract and they're claiming compensation for a rise in the minimum wage. Um, and a very recent one, a Mexican transport company is um, suing Portugal over a decision not to proceed with the privatisation of Lisbon's public transport. So there are examples of these companies suing governments uh, uh, over actions by courts, by national governments, by state governments, by local governments, and over all of that variety of decisions that I've just outlined. And basically, these um, proposals about medicines and ISDS undermine people's human rights. So we don't want them in the RCEP. If you look at what organisations like Doctors Without Borders are saying, they've got a whole campaign against these proposals in the, TP, in the RCEP because they point out that nearly half of the global population relies on the low-cost generic drugs that are produced in India and China. And if they have to change their patent laws, they won't be able to produce these drugs in a timely fashion the way they can now and uh, de people in developing countries simply won't have access to them. And that ISDS cases undermine um, regulation of the drug prices as well. Uh, and it, just today there was a release of a UN report, the UN Human Development Report, and there have been previous UN reports which have criticised both um, medicine monopolies in trade agreements and ISDS for undermining um, human rights. So there has actually been a lot of resistance to these proposals in the TPP and I feel I should say that what killed the TPP was not just Donald Trump. That there were campaigns against the TPP in most TPP countries including Australia and in the US there was a very strong campaign from unions, environment groups and other community groups and it was that campaign which prevented the TPP from being ratified before by the Congress before the US election and which made it an election issue uh, in the presidential election. So it was really the progressive community campaign which killed the TPP, um, or at least put it off long enough for Donald Trump to be able to kill it after the presidential election. And it's good to remind ourselves of that because it shows us that what we do can make a difference. Um, it's people power that can have an impact on these trade agreements. And that's what we're doing again with the RCEP. Um, so over 80 groups in 13 of the RCEP countries have got together and organised and produced public statements and we've been um, organising public events and uh, demonstrations against um, the various negotiations that have been go going on, uh, particularly in the last year or so. Um, so um, in this we're helped somewhat by the fact that the RCP is a multipolar kind of arrangement and not all of the countries are just going to agree easily to these proposals. For instance, the, both the medicines and the ISDS proposals are being resisted, particularly by India and some of the ASEAN countries and to some extent China. Uh, not because they're just good guys, but because they have, for instance, 
large generic medical um, medicine uh, industries and they don't have an interest in having longer monopolies on medicines. Um, but, um, and there are other differences which have slowed the negotiations as well. So what we actually um, are fighting for in the long run is a more just trade system which should improve people's lives. It shouldn't have Trade agreements shouldn't have these proposals in them which will make people's lives worse. And um, as um, was pointed out at the beginning, we're a network of 60 community organisations and many individuals who campaigns around these um, issues. We campaign successfully with others in TPP countries against the TPP agenda. And in Australia in particular, we did prevent the Australian government from passing the TPP implementing legislation, which they still wanted to do right up until February this year, even though it was dead. They wanted to do that because they wanted to claim that our Parliament had endorsed that agenda so they could use it in other trade agreements. Now, we successfully campaigned to get a Senate inquiry. That report um, said no to the TPP implementing legislation, so the Parliament has not approve the TPP in Australia. And that's very important for our campaign um, against the similar proposals in the RCEP. So we'll continue to campaign to keep TPP-like proposals out of the RCEP um, with our colleagues in other RCEP countries. And you can go to our website, which is aftinet.org.au, for more information. And also, we have Facebook and Twitter um, that you can use in uh, social media, that we use in social media campaigns. And I have a leaflet here which outlines a lot of the points I've made um, on the RCEP and it has our website and other social media references on the back. So um, I'll just hand those out to people um, when we finish talking. Thanks very much.